Boom, boom. Can you hear me? Okay, that's all you're going to hear. That is. Better than that. Glad you're here. I know I said that a few times, but like I said, ask my wife if I get a tip. You believe it's good to kind of shake it up a little bit sometimes. To be shook up, you know. I I was thinking about um, this uh, series on James. Boy, you know, um, I don't know how James would be received if he were to preach these messages the way he teaches out of his book. I talk about being straightforward and practical. You know, sometimes we read scriptures in the Bible, you can be a little confused. You know, like it's not, but boy, with James, when you're done, you're not confused. He just says, this is the way it is. This is what God wants. And he does it by leading the way by saying, I'm a servant of Jesus myself. Remember, we talked about that when we started this series. And as we continue to walk through the book of James, we're reading this book as a manual of how to live as a follower of Jesus. It's your manual. It's a, it's um, how many have ever bought a, uh, a device, maybe a bike or a toy or a, a something from Ikea. And you, you look at it, you say, I'm going to put this together. And four hours later, you have uh, skin knuckles. You, you've hurt your witness and the things no more put together than it was because you didn't look at the manual, did you? Not that in some cases it would help everybody. Manuals don't help in all cases. But uh, this is the manual for Christian living. It's the first book written, and it's written by the stepbrother of Jesus. They're the same mom. But it's written by a servant of the Lord. So you're going to only embrace this as you see yourself as a servant of the Lord. First John and some of the other books are good, and the book of John for new Christians. But this is for somebody, when they get saved, they, when they say, I'm not here, I don't just see Jesus as my Lord, but I, as my Savior, but I, I see him as my Lord. In other words, I get my marching orders from God's Word. How I handle my marriage, how I handle my friendships, my job, how I work my job, I get my marching orders from God's Word. In other words, I want to live out my life within the blessings and boundaries of the Bible. I really believe that the Bible's got all the wisdom that I need. And that's why James says, he says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask. Now, there's two ways we communicate with God. God communicates to us through his word, and we communicate to him through prayer. And then, as I like to say, as Pentecostals, the Holy Spirit can also, you know, shake us up and descend upon us and give us, uh, uh, in fact, all Christians, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes with you. Do you know that? When you get Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, well, I'm going to leave. And the disciples said, no, no, don't leave. Can, wouldn't that have been you? How many of you had walked with Jesus and he was going to leave? I know I'd been one of them saying, please, Jesus, don't leave. And he said, if I don't leave, the Father won't send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's that thing that gives us a, that conviction or that unction to stop talking when we shouldn't and start talking when we should. That Holy Spirit convicts us. It's our best friend when we start to go into a danger area. When we start to do the act in our own strength and not on the strength of the Lord. And so last week we talked about trials and tribulations so that as Christians we might become eventually mature. And they, they use the word perfect in the King James, but what it really means is complete. We become mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And maintaining this perspective is, hard, is a hard thing to do when life's giving us lemonades, when people are slinging mud in our face, isn't it? That's a hard thing to do. And so that's why James says, right after he tells us to do that, he says, but if you lack wisdom, go ahead and ask. <laughs> How many of you have needed wisdom when things aren't going well? When you're being overlooked when you should be looked at and when you're being overjudged when you should be not looked at? Yeah. When you're being talked about or betrayed or let down. The passage that we're going to read today continues in that line of thought, but it dials in on a specific temptation. And that temptation is to, it comes with, having too much money or not enough money how many of you like to be tempted with having too much money come on raise your hand <laughs> go ahead lord tempt me tempt me tempt me but you know the bible says that rich people really wealthy people they have struggles that you well that i don't have i don't know about you maybe maybe you do better you know what i you know i took a healthy attitude toward finances only i did years ago and uh, i see my wife is back did you bring the chicken amen. you can stay amen she amen the chicken <laughs> I've been up here preaching for seven minutes, not a word. I said chicken, and she said amen. What does that tell you? <laughs> when it comes to finances, we decided that, that we would just trust the Lord, and whatever, our, whatever door he opened for us for ministry, that we would believe that that was where we were supposed to be financially. In other words, 
We never, we never asked the people on this side of heaven for more money, and we never, and we just accepted whatever, the, however the church took care of us, and has kept us healthy, has kept us grateful. We don't even think about that. In other words, we're just we settled in. Doesn't mean that we're not. Uh, we, we try not to be entrepreneurs and invest wisely. We, we don't. We haven't. I was a youth pastor until I was 37. So how many of you know I didn't start investing until I was well after 37? Because <laughs> youth pastors think they're going to live forever. You know. I mean, but. But we just decided to accept where we were in our place and to live within our means. That's wisdom, isn't it? And I believe that's godly wisdom. Be content with what you have and live within your means. We'll circle back around to that contentment part. part but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to be great, great um, employees. And if we have a business, make our business, you know, uh, successful. God, that's God's plan. But in this book of James, it talks about these two ends of the spectrum. Where you see yourself. What, what, where you, where, how you're going to live within those realms. And there's two temptations that come. And like I said, you can either be tempted when, you're, when you see yourself as in poverty, or you can be tempted when you live in wealth. Like I said earlier, I guess if we could pick one, I'd rather be tempted to live in wealth until you find out that oftentimes following through and living for Christ, if you're really wealthy, can be tougher than if you're in poverty. Let's look at it in one of the areas. The Bible makes it clear, and I'll just tell you, I've lived this out and as I've raised funds for missions and stuff. It's not the wealthy that give always are the most generous. Isn't that interesting? It's not the wealthy that are always the most generous. Oftentimes, and why is that? Oftentimes we see that people who live with need respond to need. Does that make sense? Of course it does. In other words, if you don't have need, if you don't know need, then needs don't minister to you. But if you see, if you've lived with need, if you know what it's like to go without, when you see people in need and need uh, benevolence, need investing in, uh, then you're more prone to be moved by that. That's where we get empathy from. We place our need, we remember our need and our, our lack, and we say, I want to respond to that lack. If we're not careful when we have uh, too much wealth or we're too comfortable, we can miss those opportunities to be used by God because we don't think about it because we don't remember when we were in need. Now, don't be mis don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we're supposed to want to have lack. I'm not, supposed to, I'm not saying you're more spiritual if you have lack. I'm just saying there's a temptation. Let, let me just read it to you here. Oh, by the way, before you decide whether, how many people think you're wealthy? Let me see your hand. How many of you think you're leaning more toward the poverty side? Well, you're just perfectly balanced. Okay, let's eat. I can end this message right here. Wow, you're just right in the middle. Well, let me just tell you, before you decide whether you're rich or poor, you need to look, know this, and I pulled this stat off the, uh, it's, I forget the name, it's some real fancy-sounding inter-global financial site. One-third of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. Let me say that again. One third of the world's population lives on less than two dollars a day. How many think you're wealthy now? Yeah, you do, of course. So we would be prone to be have to be careful that we don't that we don't uh, allow ourselves to maybe look around, drive through the wrong neighborhood, or you know, uh, you can go. Uh, there are certain neighborhoods that Lil and I used to take the kids to for Christmas lights, and we drive through them, and man, they were just spectacular. But we'd also go into some of the poorer places, and those people did their very best to decorate their homes, too. Have you ever noticed that? In other words, you have to have some perspective when you're driving around these neighborhoods. What, what was the expression I learned as a kid? I, uh, I felt bad about the fact that I had no shoes till I met a man who had no feet. That's not very good grammar. I, I, Carrie's not listening too close, but I said, I felt bad that I didn't have any shoes till I met a man that didn't have any feet. In other words, it's perspective, isn't it? We can always find somebody who has so much more than us that we feel that we've been deprived, or we can find somebody that is has more want than us that we feel blessed. It's really up to us to choose properly, isn't it? You know, like you say, you come and drive around a resort like this, and you see these uh, beautiful homes that people have here, and you can say, "Wow, praise God! I'm, you know, what a wonderful place." Or if you're not careful, you can start to say, "Wow, I, I could never live in a place like this." Don't do that. <laughs> Thank God that we get to visit and that there's a beautiful place like this on a beautiful lake. It's all how we choose. And I've enabled this part three of the uh, book of James, a proper perspective. James 1 verse 9 says it this way. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. Let the lowly brother, that's the person who's, that doesn't mean height wise. So don't be making up your own jokes. That means somebody who's financially low. 
but the rich in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field he will pass away, for no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. You see the warning there for both extremes, isn't there? There's a warning there for both extremes, and I want to tell you what it is. But let's pray first. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, it's truth. Lord, we pray, God, that you would renew our mind. And please, Lord, change our hearts. We want to be more like you. We thank you for it now in your precious name. All God's people say it. Amen. Amen. So what are the temptations here for both the impoverished or the poor and the wealthy or the rich? What are the temptations? Now, many of you didn't raise your hand on either one of them, and I get that. I, I understand that if, you know, we tend to look toward, you know, the very poorest. We've seen those commercials, and we think of the very rich, the people who, you know, millionaires you might see on TV, and we think we settle somewhere in the middle. But I just really like to remind, and I do this at New Hope all the time, so... Uh, they've heard this before. Somebody's still celebrating the Lions win. That's it. Now, how many of you believe in miracles? The Lions beat the Super Bowl Chiefs. Huh? Come on now. Come on now. Hey, y'all been praying. I've been, I've been making, I've been teasing you people for 30 years about your Lions, and they win a game, and you can't give a hey now. Come on now. They won this. They beat the Super in in Kansas City. Wow. I believe in miracles too. So, the Bible makes it clear that whether you're wealthy or poor, that you got to you got to make sure that there to recognize the pitfalls of your situation. To the very poor, in poverty, you might be tempted to curse God. In Proverbs thirty verse seven and nine, it says, two things I request of you." Deprive me not before I die. Remove falsehood and lies from me. Now listen to this. Give me neither poverty. How many can say amen to that? Lord, give me, don't give me poverty. But watch what the writer says. Nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me. Let me be full and deny you. Lest I be full and deny you. Who's the Lord? In other words, don't let me take credit for your blessings. That's the temptation of the wealthy. We begin to lean on our wealth and say, I'm doing pretty good. And how many of you know with wealth and things, you can fill up your schedule to where you don't have time to take opportunities that, are, that God presents to you? Come on now. I remember walking around in the yard with somebody years ago. They bought a home, beautiful home, and with a lot of opportunities for recreation of all kinds. And they, were, they never missed. They would come to Sunday school, to church, came Sunday night, came Wednesday night. We prayed, and, and they got the deal they wanted and got the place. And this is years ago, so, and you don't, you know, you don't try to figure out who it was, but I'll just tell you, within a few short time, a lot of the opportunities that they availed themselves to, they weren't involved with the ministry. Think about that. We prayed, God blessed them with what they wanted, and they filled up their schedule with those opportunities. Who's the Lord? Huh. I did this. I earned this. I got this. Or lest I be poor and end up stealing and profaning or cursing the name of God. You might say, oh, poor people. Remember Job's wife? Who remembers Job's wife? Oh, man. You know, look at your wife and say, if you, how many of you got your wife here with you? I'll look at my wife. Honey, I'm glad you're not Job's wife. I'm serious, man. Here he's got all these problems and troubles, all this heartache and hurt, and his friends have abandoned him. You know the story is he's, he's lost it all. The only thing that God said, you can't kill him. And he's got, and all his friends left him, and that was bad enough, but it, you know what was worse than his friends leaving him? His wife not leaving him. I'm not pro-divorce or anything like that, but it would be nice if she took a long vacation, if you know what I'm saying. Then he could have moved while she was gone. But she gets around him, and you know what she tells him? This is her wisdom. In light of all he's been through, his loving wife. So you know, you know what, he, you know what he, she said to him? You would never say that to Adam, would you? No way. She 
said, why don't you just curse God and die? Because she was looking at all the material stuff. I mean, the flesh was coming off his bones and, and he, had, he had boils on his feet. I mean, it goes on. And he lost people that he loved. And here's his wife coming around. She looks around and says, you might as well just curse God and die. I don't need any encouraging people like that in my life. Either do you. It can happen. When poverty strikes, we would we'd be tempted to curse God and die. You might say, well, pastor... Poverty didn't strike. That's all I've ever known. You don't have a lot of the things that can... If, you, if you're living with less, there's a blessing in there. And I'm not just saying this as like I'm preaching from down up on a hill. I know I'm up here high today, higher than I normally am. But I'm just saying that you can get so much stuff and get involved in getting so much stuff that you miss out on the blessings of God. It can happen. Again, we're not looking to live in want and, and not have the things we need. We want to have the things we need. And God will give you those things. What about wealth? Well, have you ever got a raise or got a promotion and all of a sudden you were so occupied with that that you didn't have time to do the things that once were important to you, once, once was a blessing to you and your family? I will tell you that through my years as a youth pastor, I saw promotion and blessing I saw those things end up hurting teenagers within my youth groups. As dad or mom would be promoted or take opportunities to move into a bigger home or have more things. And I'm not saying, listen, thank God. Some of you have beautiful homes, beautiful homes. Blessings of God. What, what, the, what James is saying here, get the wisdom of heaven to maintain the proper perspective so those things don't take the place of what the Lord wants you to do with your life. And if you're, if you're living with one and things aren't working out, don't get so bitter about what you don't have that you, that you fail to live a life which is pleasing to the Lord. That you disconnect from the Lord because it doesn't feel like he's part of your life. God's blessed us. Listen, the Lord treats me better than I deserve. How about you? Put your hand up. Come on. You know you're blessed beyond what you deserve. So in poverty, we, we may be tempted to curse God. And in wealth, if we're not careful... We may be tempted to forget God. And how do we forget God? Well, we stop giving him the credit for what we have. We start assuming it's our, our, our own wisdom or our training. Instead of saying, I have this because all good things come from heaven. I saw, uh, uh, I'm going to say her name wrong, so I'm not going to say it. But I saw uh, a young, 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 I think maybe the youngest ever or one of the youngest ever. Tennis players win the Open yesterday. Did anybody see that or hear about that? Did you see what she did after she won the Open? Anybody see what she did? She knelt down. <clears throat> In front of the whole world. <laughs> she knelt down and prayed. I'm talking about on the bench there. where everyone could... Now ESPN said she's out there soaking up the... Soaking of the, uh, the glory or something and uh, one of the NFL coaches, I can't think of his name now I apologize, I wasn't sure I was going to use this illustration but I, he said no she's not, she's praying to God and thanking God for it, she's corrected the other ESPN announcer he used to coach the uh, Baltimore Colts what's his name? Tony yes Tony Dungy corrects that she's not, just, I thought wow, what a testimony and there she was spun right there, she didn't know the What's that? Indianapolis Well, you know, for you youngsters. Get off my lawn. <laughs> Did I really say Baltimore Colts? It's okay. We got your back. Apparently Jamie does it. So it's okay. Could have passed me a note or something. So what does it take to maintain this proper balance? What it takes is humility. That's the key. Humility helps us to maintain a proper a balance a prop through having a proper perspective. If I think I've got the perspective, then I won't go for the God to help me. When, when, I, when I go without, I need to honor the Lord that he will provide. And when I, have, when I seem to be being blessed beyond measure, I need to recognize it's not Steve. It's God's blessing. He's treating me as his child and blessing me. 
the poor, those who feel themselves impoverished, or you're going, you might not be impoverished compared to the whole world, but you feel like you're struggling, you can rejoice because the Bible says you will be exalted. That's what James is saying. God will lift you up by changing your perspective. You may not have more money. You may, you may not be eating caviar instead of uh, tuna casserole, no offense. But, but what's happening is your perspective changes because you're honoring God. And really, isn't it all, it's all about how we feel inside, isn't it? That's how people who are eating a, uh, a ham sandwich or a spam sandwich can bow their head and thank God and really mean it. And people who are having filet mignon at Ruth Chris can be bitter because they can't afford the biggest cut. Let me say that again. Someone with a proper perspective can bow their head and thank God for a spam sandwich and mean it. And someone at Ruth Chris can fight through a meal and argue and complain about the meal to the waiter because if they couldn't afford the tomahawk cut. How can that happen? By a perspective that's wrong. The Bible makes it clear, and this is, remember what I said, this is the manual for Christian living in a way which pleases God. This is how you please the Lord. You walk out this manual. The poor can rejoice because they will be exalted, and those lacking wealth can focus on other people's blessing. Wait a minute, Steve, now you're really kicking us around. Oh, yeah, that's right. When you honor the Lord, you can actually be, when you walk in close with Jesus and walk in the Spirit, you can actually be happy because someone else is getting blessed. And that may sound foreign to you, but I challenge you that being, when you're being happy, does it really matter where it's coming from or how you're getting there? In other words, if you'll learn to be actually blessed and rejoice at someone else's happiness, you're still rejoicing, you're still happy. I know that that seems odd and strange, but I will tell you as a minister, God's ta taught me that years ago, that I can rejoice when I hear of other churches and other ministries being blessed. And that's genuine. Because I decided that we're all on the same team. I decided that we're all part of the same kingdom. So when I hear about another church experiencing revival, or another church uh, receiving a blessing, let me give you an example. I, when we, when we, our pews at the church were, had, were dated and, and um, they were not solid wood, they were that lacquered wood that has that plastic stuff on the, instead of real wood. How many know what I'm talking about? I know, I see Jerry out there. Jerry knows what I'm talking about because we had to take some apart and put them back together and when we mobbed the sanctuary and they'd they been picked apart and they were looking ratty and so we had talked about, you know, maybe we should try to get some other seating. And um, uh, so I met, I met we, what are we going to do? We found out that the nice enough chairs that would last were pretty expensive. Each chair, like 70 bucks a chair, $76, even the price we wanted. And so about that, not long after I get a call from a, church that had been blessed, a big church in Brighton, and they said, hey, we've got chairs, would you like them? And I said, well, yeah, let me, well, I actually said, let me see them. <laughs> yeah. But, because uh, I was taken aback that another church from across the state would just call, no, I said, well, how much? They said, free. I, then I really said, let me see them. <laughs> and uh, there, I said, wow, yeah, I like them. So we went over there to, with a big truck and picked them up, a uh, U-Haul. And when we and they gave us uh, some, and they said, "Well, can you take a few more?" I said, "Sure." And when I got back, I said to the, uh, our, the board, "I said, uh, I got really more chairs than we, you know, can put in the sanctuary and make it look nice, and more than we need." But I said, "I want, uh, and and if we grow, we'll just stack them in there and make it." But I said, "But along the way, if we don't need them, I reserve the right to come back to you and ask you, could we bless another church if they needed chairs?" So we've been storing these chairs. I think we've got 275, maybe, yeah, 280 chairs. And uh, we've been storing them in um, one of the rooms in the front and down in the basement of the parsonage. And about a month ago, another church called, and, uh, they, well, they just had mentioned that they were, their pews had been falling apart and they, and they didn't have any money. Actually, it's the church that we went, it's Cooperstown, the church that we went and helped them uh, revitalize their building. And, I, and they said, hey, we're, we'd like to go to chairs. Um, you have nowhere I can get some. And I said, I absolutely do. And so I was able to get, inform them and give them. And so they're coming out, and they're, they're picking up 80 of our chairs that we've had in storage. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Maybe. I hope you're not. Wait a minute. When we grow, we're going to need those chairs. But the Lord spoke to my heart. You know what he said? Coach, can you see me over there? You know what he said? 
He said, if you grow to 300, you're going to be able to afford to buy your own chair. Somebody say amen. Come on. In other words, what a blessing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, we got chairs in storage. We got a church that needs chairs. Right. Somebody looked at us one time. They had chairs they didn't need. They blessed us. See, we're blessed to be a blessing. That's how it rolls out. Come on, say amen. You know it's true. Listen, our, the, the fellowship hall that we call the gym now, mini gym in our church, set unfinished for 12 years. And when we came here, we put made it for, we want to finish this. Uh, the insulation was hanging down, the lighting wasn't right, da, da, da. and so we didn't have enough money to do it. And so here we go, we have a first mission trip in, in, in America, and we decide, we're like, hey, we don't, we don't really have... Um, uh, we, we don't really have uh, the money to finish it. And I got this call and uh, a church in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. They would bought a, um, a car dealership, but it was unfinished. And we had a lot of time. We had uh, plumbers and carpenters and sheetrock people in our church. And uh, so the, they didn't have any money. They didn't have any workers like that. They had people, but no workers that could do that. They had laborers and people like that. And so uh, they... Uh, we prayed about it. We talked to the district in Rhode Island, and they said, uh, yeah, come on out. So 27 of us made a, we were like a caravan of, of Michiganders heading out to uh, Rhode Island. Now, I'm a, I can't stand the Boston Red Sox, so we wouldn't have done this if it was Massachusetts, just to be clear. But it was Rhode Island. And we went out there. Here's our, here's our fellowship hall, unfinished. Now, that, some of y'all can't, can't picture that, but you, if you were there, you remember how it was. You know, yeah, that, that, that wasn't cotton candy falling in your potluck. That was uh, insulation, you know, so. Talk about roughage. And so, there we go. What are you doing? And somebody, and they didn't say it mean. They just said, how come we're going out there? To, oh, and by the way, God had blessed our missions and budget, so we sent them almost $9,000 because they needed money to buy, buy material. You say to me, Pastor Steve, that is so foolish. Why are you why are you investing your spend, you don't even have your own fellowship Paul? Can you hear can you hear the, the, the cry there? I mean that's practical wisdom in one sense, but wisdom from heaven says that you're supposed to be generous and invest in others. So we prayed, God told us to do it, and out we made a caravan out there, and we spent a week out there, invested in that, and during that time, situations came where somebody through their, through their love for our church. By the time I got back, or shortly thereafter, some of you know this story. How many of you know this story? They made a significant donation to our church to where we could finish that fellowship hall. I want to tell you something. It was the right thing to do, even if that would not have happened. Because when others are blessed, you receive the blessing. That's what Jesus taught. And so when you can, so you can actually in your poverty, you can still rejoice when other people are blessed. The key is, is to get, get to the rejoicing part. I get my eyes off of what I don't have and put my eyes on how God is blessing other people. Amen. Come on, church. You see, if one, if a person is poor, James says you can still be spiritually rich. And here's the thing I know about that. And I te I've done this a few times, and please, it's not often. And don't judge me on just this if you don't know me. But if I, if I when I when I go out to eat, if we spend any time, I I talk with everybody. I talk with the, the hostess, and I chat with the waitress, and you know, I I just talk to everybody. Like I, you know, I chat them up. How many of you know that that's my person? And so sometimes when the waitress comes, you know, I. My wife loves this, by the way. She eggs me on to do this. I say, like if there's a table of 10 or 12, I'll say, hey, folks, hasn't the waitress done a great job? And she'll smile. I say, let's give her a hand. And everybody claps. I know she's a little embarrassing now. I look at her and say, now, see, if we'd have given you a tip, you'd have just spent that. But you'll never forget this. <laughs> They'll just begs for me to do that every time. But I won't do it every time. Now, of course, we give her a great tip. And by the way, Christians ought to be the biggest tippers in the world. Did you know that? Anyway. You see, when it comes to riches, 
We're told to store up riches in heaven. Riches down here, we're going to spend them. Amen? Riches in heaven, they can't be spent. They're waiting for us. So you can be poor, in a sense, down here, but you can be spiritually rich. Choose, James says, to be spiritually rich. Choose that. Choose to rejoice in other people's blessings. Because when you do that, you, you, you're still rich in a sense. You may not have every toy and every uh, tool and every fashion that's available, but you can still be spiritually rich. Matthew said it this way, Do not lay for yourselves treasures on earth, where must and rust destroy, moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But watch this, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break and steal. You see, when you invest in a church in Pawtucket, you're laying up treasures in heaven. When you invest in a Bible school in Belgium, you're laying up treasures in heaven. Are you hearing the difference? You say, well, and by the way, it, it, it could be your labor of love. Not everybody can write a check. It could be your prayer investment. That's not an excuse to be stingy, but some people can't. And by the way, the Lord keeps account on a scale of it. It's called, that's why tithing is 10%. You know, that's why he's moved by the widow's might. Because it's a percentage thing. Some give some. Some give all. <laughs> and God sees everything. So the idea is, you know, you might think that, oh, that person's a big giver, a big investor. I will tell you that what keeps people, what keeps missionaries on the field, what keeps ministries on the road, oftentimes are the small donations of people who don't have much but have a generous heart. Did you know that? And the wealthy then, James says, can rejoice in that they're humble. You say, wait a minute. Why would somebody who is wealthy rejoice that they go through humiliation or they're humbled? Because the Bible says the meek will inherit the earth. Well, there's a nice circle. You're, you're, you have a lot. God humbles you. And then you'll inherit the earth. I don't know if everybody's buying into this message, but this is wisdom from heaven. James is a manual for how to live your Christian life. And so when God, when the Bible says that the Lord brings you to humiliation or humbles you, of course it starts in my spirit. How am I humbled in my spirit? Because when I look at all that I have, a beautiful home, a family that loves the Lord, a car that starts in the morning, I can either decide that's I did this or I can say God did this. I can walk out my life with humility or I can walk out my life chest pump, puffed up. Look at me. I'm all that. It's up to you, friend. If we allow the Holy Spirit to keep us humble. Then our attitude is we continue to stay great, uh, grateful. And the Bible says when we're grateful, that God will continue to bless those people who have that attitude. So we can actually rejoice to being humble because we know that once we're humbled, what does God say he's going to do to the humble? What's he going to do? He's going to lift them up. And there's that circle again. We're, God blesses us. We're humbled. We get humble. And God brings us back up. But if we have the wrong attitude, and we act like we did it, then we stay low. You see, just like the people who are poor, the wealthy must intentionally adopt an eternal perspective. I think sometimes it's easier for those people in want than those people who have a lot to adopt an eternal perspective. It is harder for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven than the poor because it's tougher for them to adopt eternal perspective. But friends, just because something's hard, it doesn't mean it's impossible. Remember what I said? You might say, well, I'm not rich, but remember what I said? One third of the population, $2 a day. And as I told you earlier, if you line all the Christians up, everybody here is at, toward the front of the line. So we've got to adopt the eternal perspective. And that even though we have wealth, even though that we, we are blessed, that we want to honor God and allow him to humble us. Here's what Proverbs 23 says as I get near my clothes. Do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding. It will cease. Do not overwork to be rich. There's perspective. Work to be successful, but don't overwork to be rich. Because of your own understanding, you will cease. Don't, don't set your eyes on that which is not, for riches certainly make themselves wings. 
and they fly away like an eagle toward heaven. There's a warning from Scripture. We know that riches are, are very temporary. That's what he's talking about when he says, look at that flower, it's going to dry up and fade away. He's talking about our wealth. You've heard the expression, I ain't going. No, it's, um, I'm going to say this wrong. I had it written down in my old regular notes, but they're not here. Um, you can't take it with you. You remember that expression? You ever hear that expression? So my mom would say, I'm not going because I can't take it with you. Of course, my mom was, did not know wealth at the end of her life. See, sometimes when we don't have much, we act like, you know, much doesn't matter. But I, as I said, uh, Paul speaks out in Philippians. He says, in Philippians 4, he says, Now that I regard, now that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned that whatever state I'm in, to be content. So like I said, I know people that have seem to have great want, but they're happier or blessed because they've learned to be content with less. And there's people that have a lot that are so miserable. God, it's not God. I don't know what God's will is for you when it comes to dollars and cents. But I know one thing is I can declare. It's not God's will for you to be miserable. If you're a believer of Jesus Christ, you've been, you've been given a pass to abundant living. The way to do that is to pray for contentment. We all know that the love of money is where evil is birthed. Did you know that? The love of money is where evil is birthed. Well, there's a warning for all of us. Paul's writing Timothy, and I read this to you in closing in the Amplified Version. He says, godliness is actually a source of great gain when accompanied by contentment. That contentment which comes from a sense of inner confidence based on the sufficiency of God. For we have bought nothing into the world, so it is clear that we cannot take anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Those who are not financially ethical and crave to get rich with a compulsive, greedy longing for wealth fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction, leading to personal misery. For the love of money that is the root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith. Oh my goodness. They've lost their way with the Lord and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Well, there's our warning. There's a warning for us. Since we've declared that we're on the wealthy side of life, God help us. It didn't say money was evil. Money is a tool to bless others. Say amen. Money is a tool to spread the gospel. But the love of money brings tragic results. But living for Jesus is the great equalizer. It equalizes. You know, in a world where politicians, they try to divide us, don't they? They try to divide us into tribes and into, you know, ethnic and race and just divide, divide, divide. And it even can creep into the church. But Jesus is a great equalizer. He comes in and he says, no, you came in with nothing and you're going to leave with nothing. In poverty, then, we should worship as if we are rich, because in internal rewards, we are wealthy. In wealth, we should maintain a humble and contrite spirit, because we recognize that anything we have is a blessing from the Lord. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Would you stand with me and bow your heads? Heavenly Father, your word is true. God, forgive me for times in my life where I've taken my eyes off the prize and I've allowed my spirit and attitude to be affected by wood, hay, and stubble, things that will not last. Lord, help me to live my life in a way which shows that I am blessed, that I rejoice in all you've given me, God, and that eternal rewards far outweigh anything that I could hold in my hand, anything that I could have in my bank account. Lord. Instead, God, I pray that you'll Give me the opportunity, to Lord, to reflect, Lord, what's important to me is what is important to you. Let that be my life challenge, God. And Lord, I pray for these people here today, God. I pray, God, as we commit our life to you, we, Lord, we need wisdom. And you said through James, the book of James, that if we lack wisdom to ask. So when it comes to eternal rewards and blessings, I pray, God, that we would continue to ask you. That our prayer life would function in a way, God, that we would continually turn to you. 
Not just on the big decisions, God, but as we meter out our life. That we'll trust your word to provide the answers we need to live in a way that pleases you. And we thank you for it and give you all the praise and glory. All God's people say it. Amen, amen and amen. God bless you.